Next, I want to give special thanks to my Patreon and channel supporters that make these videos possible. It's them that provide the funds for me to travel to museums and without them, this content would not exist. Hello everybody and welcome back to Military Aviation History. I am your host Bismarck and today I am in the Flugwerft Schleisheim, part of the Deutsche Museum in Munich, looking at an iconic aircraft from World War II. The BF-109 is perhaps the most well-known German aircraft of all time. Introduced into the late 1930s, it went where the Germans went and it would become a symbol of the very sort of aggressive expansion of the armed forces, the later conflict, but also perfectly encapsulates the essence of a fighter aircraft. World War II brought many different iconic aircraft, but whether we like it or not, just like with the German Tiger tank, the Messerschmitt has become a category in itself, and I don't say this lightly. Personally, I adore planes of all shapes and sizes, but having done this job for a little while now, I have noticed a tendency throughout this time, uh, whether it's in the literature or in popular memory, to return to a singular entity. And this is, when it comes to World War II warbirds, the omnipresent status of the 109. It is almost as if there are planes and then there is the Messerschmitt. So before we have a look inside of this one, let's go over its history. After the First World War, Germany was forbidden to have an air force and strict conditions were put in place for civilian aviation and engine development. On paper, Germany had been neutered. In the embers of the Great World War, however, Germany remained restless and put into place various measures to ensure that should the moment arise, it can relatively quickly build up a new air force. When the Germans decided in 1935 to rearm and re-establish a new air force, the Luftwaffe, this was not exactly a surprise for anyone in the know. At the previous year, 1944, the newly established Reichsluftfahrtsministerium, the Air Ministry, approached the main German companies for a fighter design. The first prototype of what would be the BF-109 was drawn up relatively quickly. The construction finished in May 1935 and there are two interesting features of this aircraft that are often overlooked. First off, the plans did foresee an installation of a central mounted 20mm cannon firing through the propeller hub, mirroring essentially the later variants from the F model upwards. No suitable cannon, however, was available, so the plans were shelved. Second, the plane is equipped with a British engine, the Rolls Royce Kestrel. Ironically, the Heinkel company, developing a competitor to the BF 109, made sure this deal was possible. The engine is not uh, the final power plant of course, but it does enable Meshmer to test the machine and work out the kinks and it does does a contributing factor for making sure that the machine actually gets ready for the trial flights versus the competition. The BF 109V2 squares off against the Heinkel HE112, the Arado R80 and the Focke-Wulf FW159. The latter two don't make it, but the Heinkel aircraft is a fierce opponent. Both aircraft align closely with the desires of the air ministry. They are fast, have good characteristics in dive and climb, are maneuverable and are relatively easy to produce. V2 doesn't survive for long, so V3 steps in. This is also the first machine to receive weaponry and it also receives radio equipment, which is a novelty at the time. To test both the 109 and the Heinkel 112, Germany decided to send a good number of each to Spain to take part in the Spanish Civil War. In Spain, the BF-109 goes through highs and lows. There are still troubles with the machine, of course, the weaponry, the power plant and the radios, but it does show itself to be a substantial improvement from the older biplanes the Germans were using at the time and it fares really well against the Soviet I-16. 
The so-called A and B series were still equipped with the liquid-cooled Jumo 210 with a maximum output of 680 horsepower. At this point, the 109 uses uh, two, sometimes three, machine guns of a 7.92 mm caliber. This was standards a few years before, but newer machines have substantially more. The I-16, for example, sits at four machine guns, and in Britain, the Hurricane and Spitfire start rolling out with eight. Because there is still no way to reliably install a 20 mm cannon in a central position, experiments are conducted with wing-mounted machine guns and uh, later cannons, of course, of the 20 mm caliber, the MGFF being chosen. Although these did not roll out until 1938. Coming to the E model then, uh, the aircraft finally reaches maturity. The standard fuel injected DB601A engine a production has kicked off and provides a maximum 1,100 horsepower to the aircraft. This is a perceivable increase in power from the barely 700 horsepower of the Jumo. So the aircraft also needs to go through substantial changes to accommodate the new power plant. The aircraft also saw a complete rework of the liquid cooling engine cooling which now ran via the wing mounted radiators. The gear also had to be strengthened to reliably hold the extra 450 kilograms and the fuel tank was enlarged to accommodate 400 liters due to the higher demands of the DB601. While attempts were made to once again accommodate an engine mounted 20 mm cannon here, the internal layout changes did not allow for this at this time. Based on these changes then, the BF-109E1 is adopted into the Luftwaffe in 1938. Let's quickly go over the design and essentially the specifications here. The aircraft is 8.8 .8 meters in length, it spans 9.9 .9 meters and it stands at 2.6 meters. It is powered by the Daimler-Benz 601 engine, powering it with 1,100 horsepower. That allows it to go to 570 kilometers an hour. Empty weight is roughly 1,900 kilograms and loaded goes up all the way to 2,600 kilograms. Now the aircraft has a mixed armament. There are two MG-17s, these are 7.92 millimeters in caliber, mounted on top of the engine cowling. Uh, these actually have a substantial ammo capacity of 1,000 rounds each. Additionally, the aircraft has two 20 millimeter cannons, one in each wing. These are the MGFFs, later on the MGFF-Ms, and they hold 60 rounds each. With the exception of the control surfaces and the flaps, which were essentially uh, metal skeletons covered in canvas, you have an aircraft that is all metal. And Messerschmitt actually designed this aircraft to be, for the time, mass produced. And so we do see certain improvements in the 109 that allow that mass production, that very intensive sort of manufacturing techniques on a large scale uh, taking place. The fuel tank of the 109 is essentially below the pilot. It is shaped in an L shape, similar to a chair. And yes, he essentially is sitting on it. Uh, it sort of goes like this. And it has a capacity of 400 liters, which for the aircraft's purpose was what you needed. It gave it around one hour of flight time, and a little bit more, of course, if you stretched it. Uh, but this aircraft was designed essentially to go up in the air, climb, find the enemy, defeat the enemy, come back, refuel, restock your ammo and go back out again. It was sort of a air superiority fighter. It wasn't meant as a long range escort. One of the things we often talk about with the 109 are of course the leading edge slats and they help the pilot or assist him in retaining control of the aircraft at low speeds or uh, help maneuvering at those speeds as well. Uh, the slats are deployed automatically and in fact Willy Messerschmitt is not the one that came up with this specific design but he gets the license from a British company just before the war um, and he also uses it as in his B of 108 design. When Germany invades Poland, the vast majority of their Messerschmitts are of the E1 type. However, a transition to the E3 is in motion. This aircraft brings with it a substantial change in firepower at the hands of two wing-mounted 20mm MGFF cannons. While possessing not the best characteristics for aerial combat, they certainly pack a punch, although the pilot was limited to 60 rounds each. Uh, this aircraft was also exported to multiple nations, uh, Bulgaria, Japan, Japan, uh, Yugoslavia, although without the wing-mounted cannons on that one, uh, Romania, Switzerland, Spain, and surprisingly, three of them actually went to the Soviet Union. What made the 109 such a good machine is that it possessed the one quality you want as a fighter pilot at the time, and that was to be the one who sets the terms of the engagement. 
In the 109, you had the speed and the performance to engage an enemy if you wanted, but most critically, unless you messed up big time or got surprised, you had the liberty to disengage as well with a powerful dive. This is perhaps the critical advantage that made this aircraft a fighter pilot's wet dream and what separates it really from a lot of its early contemporaries. This also sets the tone for the German conceptualization of air warfare and has an influence uh, in further designs, but ultimately actually it comes back to haunt them as the Allies roll out with more powerful machines as well. The Beef 109 had a phenomenal production run. Very few have survived to this very day. Might have something to do with the fact that Germany, well, lost the war. Um, in any case, among these rare aircrafts, the E-model is even rarer, as it is the oldest mass-produced type of 109. The one we have here is, well, its historic value is not easily described. Uh, we know it was built in 1938, so it is one of the first E3s to actually have been produced. And it was one of 45 E1s and E3s that were sent to Spain between 38 and 39. After the Legion left, the machines were retained. Payment was given in the form of mining rights that Germany got from Spain. Spain also kept the E-models in service long after the Second World War ended. In fact, they were only phased out after the Hispano Aviación HA-1112, an interesting mix of a BF-109 paired with a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, appeared in the mid-1950s. There is relatively little known about the service uh, life of this particular aircraft, although the running gag here in the museum is that about half of the Condor Legion has been built into this one uh, to keep it flying. For example, the uh, port wing comes from a completely different E3 model, while starboard uh, originates from an E1. In essence, the sacrifice of many other 109s and the dedication of the Spanish to keep her in service ensured that we have at least one example left dating back all the way into the late 1930s. In 1960, Spain gifted this aircraft to the Deutsche Museum, and at this point it had been uh, repainted in a camo scheme reminiscent of Jagdgeschwader 26. I now want to introduce you to the cockpit. I wasn't allowed to sit inside this aircraft, the historic value of the machine is just too high for the museum to take that risk, but they were kind enough to make a special exception by opening up the canopy and allowing me to film from the wing. Once again, a big thank you to the staff of the Deutsches Museum. The canopy hinges sideways towards starboard, kept in place by a metal string. When closed, this string folds up inside, behind the pilot's head. Looking at the seat, unless the museum changed the layout, it might be that the Spanish actually never made any modifications to this. It looks like it's still the original early model seat. You can recognize this from the shoulder straps that run via a single cutout in the seat. A quick look at the port side here. Here we have the flap and elevator trim control. The placement side by side allowed you to operate both at the same time. Moving slightly forward, we see the throttle control. This is not the early E-model throttle, but a model that was used on later machines with an integrated propeller pitch control switch. And this is going to make things very interesting in just a few minutes, so remember it. The orange handle slightly below the throttle is for the oiler cooler flap setting. The red handle sitting on the side of the canopy, that's the emergency release. And the white handle in the back is the fuel cock. Going through the instruments now from top to bottom. Here is the all-important clock. No cockpit is complete without one, of course. Next to that is the gun sight, offset slightly to the right. This one is the Reflexvisier C12E, and this is usually abbreviated to Revi C12E. Considering the production number, I have a feeling that this one comes from a later production run from the 1940s. One row down, starting on the left, the magnetos. The red button is the emergency circuit breaker. It's right next to it, to the left. Moving towards the right, the altimeter in metric, followed by a magnetic compass. Although the cockpit is generally well preserved, the age is clear to see on this one. Further to the right, the manifold pressure. As always in German planes, this is given in ATA or ATA, that's technical atmospheric pressure, essentially kilopond divided by centimeter squared. Returning to the left, one row down, your speedometer in kph and your turn and slip. Here is the pitch control for the propeller in the early E models. And here it really gets interesting. Until the E4, the E models used this switch to manually set prop pitch as they lacked any sort of automation. 
You can see where it is set here, it's rather awkward to use because the pilot either has to let go of the control stick or reach over with his left hand that should be on the throttle. When the system for automatic prop pitch was added, he didn't really have to worry about this anymore, but the pilot could in fact still disengage the automatic system by flicking a switch set below the throttle, and then set the pitch himself using the old switch you see here, or with a new switch on the later throttle variants. And this is what makes this interesting, because this later throttle variant is the one you see here. But the aircraft itself is an early E model that should not have this automation. Either automation was later on, which I highly doubt, or what is more likely, the throttle that you see here was added sometime during the life of the plane as a spare part and has no relevance to the prop pitch system. I don't remember seeing a switch actually to turn off the automation in the first place, so it's likely that this is just a spare part added either by the Spanish Air Force or the museum. Returning to the instruments, the dial next to the pitch switch is your engine RPM with the clock-like gauge next to it indicating the prop pitch setting. And moving straight down, orange handle is your hand pump, the red handle is your emergency landing gear release, the hole above it is where your usual landing gear control switch would be, probably removed here by the museum as a safety precaution. The gauge with the two red and green lights is your landing gear position indicator and next to it you will find your oil and fuel pressure. Below we find the water cooling temperature to the right and the oil temperature to the left. If you're familiar with German aircraft, you might have expected color coding here, but as you can see, this was not applied in this case. The same goes for the fuel gauge, and this one indicates your fuel reserve in hundreds of liters. Then we have a really nice feature for the time. We have a shot or an ammo counter that is included in the aircraft's cockpit. The numbers indicate your remaining ammo supply for the cannons, counting down from 60 on either side. However, the nose-mounted MGs only have a red warning light when the ammo runs out. To the right side of the cockpit, the electrical system switches for navigational lights and so on. Usually there would be markings here indicating the use of each switch, but if they were ever applied there, Spain probably removed them for their own markings, which have not survived. An oxygen reserve for the pilot can be found to the bottom right, next to the water cooling radiator flap. If you swivel it away from you, the flap opens up, and of course, if you swivel backwards, it closes. Then there's also a small petrol tank for the starter, which is found to the direct right of the pilot. Then the control stick, it's as simple as it gets. This is a Knüppelgriff 12R. And the button that you see on top, that's the B knopf or B button. Generally speaking, the R knopf, which is also the safety catch, would rest on top of this. But once you swivel it into the position that you see it right now, the guns are essentially armed. Depending on how the guns are set up, the a knopf generally fires all weaponry, while the B-Knopf only fires a limited selection. For example, you could isolate the machine guns from the cannons. An FT knopf on the bottom of this stick is not in view, that is your press to transmit. Alright, so that finishes up the cockpit. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, consider supporting us on Patreon to help fund more content like this one and get exclusive behind-the-scenes footage. I want to thank the Flugwerft Schleißheim of the Deutsche Museum here in Munich for their uh, unparalleled access to this machine. Remember to like, share and subscribe. And as always, have a great day, good hunting and see you in the sky.